Wow. Thank you, everyone. It's um, truly an honor to be asked to give the uh, Mark Weinberg Lecture. I join a distinguished group of past lecturers, including, in order of most recent, Ken Rosenthal, James Urbinski, Francoise Barret-Sinussi, Eleanor Matika Tyndale, Michelle Ellery, Frank Plummer, Michelle Bergeron, Julio Montaner, Martin Schechter, Catherine Hankin, and Eric Art. So for me, uh, having been involved with CAR since its founding in 1991, and to see all of my friends and colleagues, I feel, as uh, you know, Mark was saying, very nervous about this presentation, simply uh, because I've been down the road thinking about the past, the present, and the future, and this is what this lecture has uh, forced me to do. And I have wonderful memories. It almost feels like my memorial uh, <laughs> talk. But anyhow. Um, these are the conflicts that I have to uh, declare. Not your typical ones, but. Well, I've known and admired Mark Weinberg, the outspoken man, the remarkable scientist, for over 25 years. I first saw him in action in 1989 when he chaired the fifth international AIDS conference in Montreal, one of the three that he's brought to Canada. When he chaired the 2006 Toronto International Conference as the scientific program co-chair, I worked closely with him over the two years and I got to see the scientist, the politician, the advocate, and the mentor at his best. He mentored me through the pitfalls and challenges, and he demonstrated genuine interest in my scientific work and career. This despite the fact that our scientific backgrounds are at the opposite end of the continuum, with Mark living in his wet lab and I in my dry lab. My interactions with Mark and other biomedical and clinical researchers have contributed to my approach, acceptance, and success in leading multidisciplinary team brands. And I thank all of you. And of course, I thank all of my fellow epidemiologists and social scientists for their support through the years. While brilliance and commitment to innovation are prevalent among HIV researchers, and every one of you should be congratulated for your work, advocacy is a rare trait. What has constantly struck me the most about Mark is his passion and willingness to speak out at injustices and in action. Mark, I thank you for being my role model. I wish you many, many long years of life. And my lecture tonight will follow in your footsteps, or try to follow in your footsteps. And I will speak out about the unspoken forces that shape our research and the battle to conquer HIV and AIDS. Applying an historical lens, as the wrinkles on my picture show, I've been around for a while, I will identify and discuss some of the structural forces that shape how we do research and what research has done. In this context, when I speak of structural forces, I mean policies, programs, practices, norms and expectations of governments, funding bodies, academic institutions, and society overall. These powerful forces are seldom challenged, sometimes invisible, and rarely the focus of research or open dialogue. When they are the topic of, of discussion, it is usually behind closed doors, while those who speak out may see or be seen as voices of the disgruntled. I will reflect on the early years of the HIV epidemic in Canada, the role and clarity of goals and the ways in which our national strategies were developed to meet those targeted goals, 
and goals were revisited on a regular basis. I will argue that while the overarching goals are still in place, they have become less coordinated, more contested, in part a reflection of the complexity of the evolving epidemic, but in large part due to these structural forces. I will propose that it's time to reinitiate a national discourse and agenda setting in order to refocus our efforts, but to do so, we will require that we consider and account for the unspoken structural forces that shape our research approach and efforts. As researchers, we hold ourselves accountable and we are held accountable by the state for the state of the progress and fight against HIV. However, rarely in national public forums do we pose the question of how research and HIV epidemic are being impacted by policies, funding bodies, the practices and policies of academia and societal norms and expectations. I will assert that unless we pose these questions and appropriately respond, we are impeding research efforts to eliminate HIV transmission, to improve health and well-being for all, and to find a cure. Just as Carr has asked that we disclose any actual or perceived conflicts of interest, I feel that you need to know where I'm located within the Canadian HIV context and history. Over the last 29 years, I have experienced the negative and positive effects of these structural forces, and I will talk about. I have participated in their creation and at times successfully and unsuccessfully challenged them. In 1984, I gave up my Shirk postdoctoral fellowship when I accepted a position with the Toronto Sexual Contact Cohort Study. The study's primary goal was to identify and quantify sexual risk behavior among men who have sex with men. And the study was initiated before we knew or even could test for the HIV virus. The results from that study were instrumental in the creation of early safer sex guidelines. Despite the fact that there were fewer than about 150 reported cases at the time in Canada, the fear, urgency, and commitment within the gay community and researchers was palatable. The experience continues to drive and shape my work to this day. After the death of the lead investigator, my mentor, Dr. Randall Coates, in 1991, I quickly managed to establish myself as an independent researcher. And by the late 1990s, I had expanded my work to countries with nascent HIV epidemics, including Russia and China. And I became more and more involved in professional services and, and volunteering to shape our political response to the epidemic. I sat and was actively engaged in many of the bodies that I will talk about today. As we all know, incredible progress has been made over the last three decades in understanding the virus and important advances have been made in prevention and treatment. But the pace at which we deliver must be maintained, if not improved. After dramatic reductions in HIV infections in Canada, we saw an increase in infections in the mid-1990s that has stabilized at around 3,000 new infections per year. According to the Public Health Agency of Canada's latest surveillance report, an estimated 71,300 people in Canada have been infected with HIV. The number of new infections in 2011 was estimated at 3,175, which is slightly lower than in 2008, when there were an estimated 3,355 new infections. However, this is hopefully the start of a downward trend, but I have my doubts. Figure one to the right shows the estimated number of new infections per year between 1975 and 2011. For those of us who saw the epidemic 
dramatic decline in incidents in the early 1990s, seeing the resurgence in the late 1990s onward has been very disappointing. We had hoped that the slope would continue to decline over the years. Polaris, Ontario's HIV seroconversion cohort, which reported this disturbing trend in 1998 at Carr, made the headlines in the summer of 2000 as we headed into the Durban AIDS conference. At first, the study results were ignored, actually took two years, or they were contested as not representative of all MSM. Figure two on the left shows new infections per year by exposure category. We see that infections in all exposure categories have continued to increase with the exception of injection drug users, which the line in red. MSM continue to comprise the greatest proportion of new infections. They represent 47% of new infections in 2011. Can I, not that I'd be able to see very many, but I'd like to have a show of hands. How many of you were born in 1980 or later in the room? Wow, okay, I am getting old. <laughs> For those of you who were born into a world with HIV, it may be a normal state to have people continuing to become infected in Canada. I was sexually active, in a world that didn't know HIV. And I really, readily acknowledge that we've all worked hard, as I've indicated, to reduce new infections and should be commended for getting them to this level. But I truly believe we can't be complacent and accept this as the way things are going to be and will continue to be. I am troubled that my vision of a world with no new infections is shared by fewer and fewer as time progresses. Some would argue that we need more resources if we're to get ahead of the epidemic. This is unlikely to happen. I want us to think of what we can do with what we have currently. My presentation is meant to challenge us to think of structural factors that impede our research progress, things that we can do better. I want to rekindle the sense of urgency that we felt in the early years of the epidemic. So back into kind of memory lane for some people. To date, there have been three national strategies. The first national strategy, entitled HIV in Canada, Canada's Blueprint, was launched in 1990, almost a decade after the first AIDS cases were documented. The second strategy, moving forward together, was released eight years later and covered the period of 1998 to 2004. The third and final strategy, the federal initiative to address HIV AIDS in Canada, was released in 2004-2005. In addition, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Infection and Immunity, has one of the four partners in the strategy, developed its own strategy to help guide research. In general, the process of renewal of each strategy could be char characterized as taking lots of time, effort, and resources, engaging an ever-increasing number of stakeholders and consultants in the process, never reaching a consensus on its content and direction, always generating lots of discussion, and leaving stakeholders feeling that they had been at least engaged in a process and aware of its content. This broad engagement has not occurred since prior to 2004. At the end of each strategy period, the progress made was evaluated, new strategic goals were set, Sometimes this process took a long time and resulted in lags in funding which jeopardized ongoing research projects and NGO programs. Faced with persistent co and coordinated years of lobbying by community 
and CAR, in 2005, the Government of Canada made a commitment to provide permanent HIV strategic funding of $84 million annually, of which $22.6 million goes to CIHR for research. I now turn to examine the specific goals, structure, and leadership of the national strategy and question whether some aspects may be serving as barriers to progress. The federal initiative identified four major goals to prevent the acquisition and transmission of new infections, to slow the progression of disease and improve quality of life, to reduce the social and economic impact of HIV, and to contribute to the global effort to reduce the spread of HIV and mitigate its impact on the disease. My question to you is, how many of these did you know? How many of you are striving to achieve one of these in your day-to-day -day work? If so, which ones? Are there some that are getting insufficient attention? Are there new ones and more pressing ones? I ask, is it not time to revisit and revise them? What about the current organizational structure for implementing the strategy? How is it working? Are the four federal partner organizations working effectively to successfully implement the strategy? What about other stakeholders? The federal initiative to address HIV in Canada identified four implementing partner organizations, the Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and Correctional Services Canada. Each partner organization has a budget allocation as indicated in Figure 1, and a specific role to play in addressing the epidemic as indicated in Figure 4. As the strategy document indicates, quote, success depends on close collaboration among coordinating partners. How well is this working? Are, the areas, are there areas of overlap? Are there areas that are contested? Are some falling through the gaps? While these are not openly discussed, some of us have experienced the tensions that exist and their consequences. While the role and budget of the four organizations are clearly laid out, I think I skipped a section. Um, while the roles are clearly laid out in the strategy, working relationships with the other key stakeholders are ambiguous. Is it, uh, it is unclear as to what processes are in place for ongoing communication and coordination. According to the strategy, the implementing partner organizations are to work with other federal departments, agencies, provincial and territorial governments, non-governmental organizations, and other stakeholders to meet the strategic goals. The concept of pan-Canadianism recognizes that no organization and no government acting alone can ever successfully overcome the epidemic, that the work of many participants from many different sectors is needed to ensure the response to HIV. While a nice motherhood statement, how it can be effectively coordinated is less clear. When I think of the arrangement and the premise of leading together, what comes to mind at optimum is a fleet of ships sailing in the same direction. But realistically, I see the second scenario. Ships and boats of different sizes, sailing different routes and going in different directions as time passes and communication is limited. More and more, I get the sense that no one is leading. With leadership comes responsibility. 
It's easier not to be accountable when there are lots of leaders. Funding mechanisms, norms, and goals of funding bodies influence what will be investigated and by whom. By distributing resources in a selected way among disciplines, investigators, funding bodies play a pivotal role in influencing the development of science. The requirements and conditions for grants, the scholar awards, are guided and vetted by bureaucrats, some far removed from the epidemic and research. We have come to accept these requirements and conditions as things that can't be challenged or changed, in part because there is no real mechanism for researchers to influence this. Most of the decisions by funding bodies and their advisory boards are made with much thought and deliberation, but at times their decisions have unforeseen negative consequences. When outcomes are examined, they're usually in terms of whether the organization's goals have been met, rarely are the mechanisms, policies, and outcomes looked at with respect to unintended consequences or in relation to the impact on research overall, and at times, their direct impact on the epidemic is not considered. Let me give you two concrete examples. When the Toronto Sexual Contact Study was coming to an end, I tried to apply to NHRDP for a scholar award to continue my HIV work. I was told that I should be applying to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada since NHRDP did not support social science scholars. Shirk indicated that they were not funding HIV research and HIV researchers. That was NHRDP's mandate. Each organization was guarding their limited resources, following their stated mandates and goals. The unintended outcome was that young social scientists who could have contributed to the HIV epidemic were turned away. Never known to be one to walk away from a challenge, I applied to NHRDP and was awarded the scholarship award, which supported my salary, allowing me to initiate a productive program of research. The second example <clears throat> is how changes in funding management can impact on grant application process and success. Prior to the formation of CIHR in 2000, HIV research was allocated into four streams and funded through two separate funding bodies, MRC, the Medical Research Council of Canada, and NHRDP. MRC managed the biomedical and clinical research streams while NHRDP managed epidemiology and public health research, the nascent community-based research program, and infrastructure for the clinical trials network. When CIHR subsumed the research previously funded by MRC and HRDP, it unintentionally resulted in lower ranking and reduced funding success of health research, such as epidemiology, public health research, social sciences which falls under the health services and population health streams now. This inequity occurred across all CIHR streams and not just HIV research funding, and was documented by Thorngate's study that examined the impact of the transition. Thorngate found that the medical review committees scored applications higher than the health review committees. This resulted in biomedical and clinical applications being ranked higher because they were in the same pool as uh, and had a higher funding rate. Over the years, this result resulted in a drop in number of non-biomedical applications, which in turn resulted in less funds being allocated to some research streams, which further reduced applications and resulted in fewer health service and population health studies being done. Similar effects were documented in Switzerland in a study examining social science applications and funding before and after its integration into the Swiss National Science Foundation. Six years after the integration took place, the study concluded that while contributing to prevention, treatment, and care, HIV-related social science research does not flourish under current funding conditions. In 2005, when the last federal strategy was renewed, 
The Government of Canada, as I indicated, made a commitment to provide permanent funding of $84 million annually, of which $22.6 goes to CIHR to fund HIV research. The rest is allocated to the other three partner institutions, as shown in Figure 1. And Figure 2 shows the distribution of funds across areas of action. The $22.6 million that, are, alloc are, uh, that are, are given to CIHR are allocated across different streams of research. 42% is allocated to biomedical and clinical research, and a 40, further 20% goes to fund clinical research infrastructure for a total of 62% of the budget. 22% is allocated to health service and population health research and 20% to the community-based research. When I served on Chirac, I questioned the unequal distribution of funds across various research streams. Allocations are made based on decisions and commitments made in the early years of the epidemic, reinforced by review committees, as we just saw, and by societal norms and expectations, something that I will return to uh, later. There are those who believe that a higher proportion of the strategic funds should be allocated to health service and population health research, which tends to generate knowledge that is specific to the context of the Canadian epidemic. This is the type of research that is not directly transferable from one country to another. If we don't do it in Canada, we don't have it, and thus don't have the critical information we need to better understand and control the epidemic. Whereas some research, such as vaccine and drug development, can be conducted anywhere in the world and, resu and the results are universally applicable. As an industrialized and wealthy nation, we have a responsibility to contribute our fair share to this knowledge. But this should be within reasonable limits and not at the cost of other types of research. A while back, I showed you a slide of the goals of the federal strategy. I would now like to briefly touch upon how CIHR, infection and immunity, has adapted them and how their mission, vision, values, and strategic goals may be impacting on the HIV epidemic and the research that we do. As you can see, the overall mission is in keeping with the goals of the HIV strategy they are to provide national leadership in support and facilitation of AIDS research, research capacity building, research partnerships, and knowledge translation. Their vision is not to end the epidemic, but in keeping with their mandate to position Canada as a global leader in research that has national and global impact on the epidemic. And I personally think that CIHR, III, Mark Gwilett, Jennifer, and staff have been doing a great job. While our understanding of the virus and how, it's how, and how to manage it has increased dramatically, the epidemic and the amount of work has not been reduced. The population and countries affected have increased the spectrum of issues has expanded, but HIV funding has remained relatively stable over the last decade. There are lots of competing priorities for funding besides research. Funding bodies have to build cost sharing, co-funding partnerships, are spending more time, evaluate an effort in evaluating the impact of the research, building in processes to make sure that research findings are known and can be com consumed by consumers and frontline workers, that policymakers are actively engaged in the research process in an effort to ensure that research findings inform policy and programs, experimenting with different models of conducting research, team grants, multidisciplinary research teams, etc., tasked with not only building research capacity among those in academia, but also community members. As you can see, CIHR's goals are many and ambitious. And in turn, CIHR and other funding bodies are asking researchers to take more and more of these responsibilities on. No longer 
are researchers expected only to create new knowledge. While I've been a strong proponent of CIHR's strategic goals and have embraced and successfully juggled them, I'm beginning to wonder at what cost. Would we conquer the HIV epidemic faster if more researchers could truly focus on the creation of meaningful new knowledge? If we were allowed to do what we are trained and are driven to do? Are there not other mechanisms and other people who should be facilitating and working on achieving many of the other goals? As you can see, this octopus is happily multitasking, but has so far managed to cut off one tentacle, injure a second, and partially cut off circulation to its brain. We can only imagine what the results of the carpentry project look like. In a consumerism-oriented society, there's a tendency to measure success by counting how many? Our academic institutions and funding bodies base our success primarily in terms of peer-reviewed publications. The more we produce, the better. The quality and meaningfulness, though important, are more difficult to gauge. Assessing the impact of our work is tempered by forces beyond our control, including time. We as HIV researchers have a responsibility to do research and to produce results that are meaningful and useful. Maybe we should ask ourselves whether we become too comfortable and set in our ways in how we approach our research and what the expected impact is. I've been too busy multitasking to do a scientific assessment of HIV-related scientific publications and journals compared to other diseases. I do know that until the mid-1990s, I was able to keep up with the literature to some extent. I could hold by two fingers the abstract book from the first International AIDS Conference in Atlanta, Georgia in 1985, and that I need, now need two arms to hold the books from the 11th International Conference held in Washington in 2012. The first is 99 pages from cover to cover. The second set is 1,695 pages. I was feeling quite deficient in my abilities to keep up with my readings until a colleague recently sent me an announcement indicating that UNAIDS has created a new platform which will highlight HIV scientific advances for those finding it a challenge to keep abreast of new developments. According to UNAIDS, in 2012 alone, there were more than 14,000 scientific papers published on HIV. That is an incredible number of articles that were deemed to be making a contribution to science. So why do we continue to have so many new infections? The last structural factor I have time to touch upon is the importance of society's norms, culture, and expectations in shaping the allocation of research funding, what research has done, and what are deemed as scientific contributions. I've already mentioned the uneven allocations of funding across different streams of HIV research. And what one might expect that the proportion allocated to particular research streams would fluctuate over time to reflect knowledge and the evolving epidemic. While they may fluctuate sl slightly, to my knowledge, the proportions have remained fairly stable over the last three federal strategies. The allocations have consistently invested more heavily in biomedical and clinical research streams than in health service delivery and population health. This is in large part reflects how we as Canadians and the Western world views health and disease. When Canadians think of health and disease, they think of basic and clinical science as the solution. While public health has received greater attention since SARS, Few people are aware of the role of public health in screening, preventing illness, and even fewer are aware of the concept of health promotion and the social determinants of health and well-being. Even those who believe that the social gradients of, he in social gradients of health and understand the social environment forces that shape health think that they're too complex 
too challenging to address in the short term, and that resources should be focused on the one-shot solution that would bypass the messiness of human behaviors and societal forces. It would be so much easier if one time, a little one-time pill or shot could be administered that would stop the infection and cure all of those who are currently infected. It was not until 1998 that the national strategy formally acknowledged that only by addressing root causes of the HIV epidemic could we bring it to an end. This assertion has not resulted in additional reallocation of funding for this type of research. For the sake of time, I will not discuss this slide in detail. The point that I wish to make is that health service and population health, HIV research in Canada today, has been too focused on individuals and not on other structures that work outside of the individual to foster or impede health. We need to invest in this approach. Besides Western society's expectations that solutions to health problems, especially HIV, lie primarily in the hands of biomedical researchers, there are those who question whether the decision to position HIV research in the Institute of Infection and Immunity was influenced by these views and has continued to reinforce it. When the institutes were created, CAR and NGOs petitioned to create an HIV research institute, arguing that many of the unique gains made by HIV might be lost or challenged if they were placed elsewhere. To address some of these concerns in 2003, III created the CIHR HIV AIDS Advisory Committee, better known as CHIRAC, to ensure it was guided by a group with in-depth knowledge of all aspects of HIV research and the community. While the historic timeline is short, to date none of the scientific directors of III and all of the chairs of CHIRAC have had an academic background in biomedical or clinical research. None have backgrounds in health service and population health. That's not to say that the men, because they are all men, have not been supportive of these streams they have, but they're not represented of them. And as they say, some of them are my own best friends. So. <clears throat> if we are like Juliet of Romeo and Juliet, we believe that it doesn't matter what the institute is named or what the background of its leaders are. But many of us are not like Juliet. In the early years of the epidemic, a decision was made that a proportion of the HIV strategic funds would be allocated to providing infrastructural support to help build research capacity in, capacity in areas of need. The very first such initiative resulted in the creation of the Canadian HIV Trials Network, which was established in 1990. In 1998, the CTN was moved to CIHR and 3.2 million per year was invested. 19 years later, in recognition of a systematic lack of Canadian capacity in health services and population health research, CIHR launched an open call and two centers in population health and health services research were created for a total investment of one million per year. The two centers are known as REACH and the Social Research Center in HIV Prevention, SRC. I have the pleasure to be the nominated PI and director of the SRC and the SRC is conducting research on how to develop viable and effective interventions that go beyond the individual level to examine and address more upstream distal influences on behavior, practices, and vulnerability. This work is extremely challenging but worth pursuing if we are to build on the existing prevention approaches and to maximize impact. The role of social and behavioral sciences is also integral to the successful implementation of biomedical and technological interventions. While efficacious in trial, evaluating their effectiveness and making them effective outside of the controlled trial is challenging. I think it will take more than $5 million invested over a five-year period for the two centers 
to leave a lasting legacy and overcome the systematic lack of capacity resulting from years of underfunding and the evolving nature of the epidemic. Many of the examples I have used today focus on research funding, which is located at CIHR. But that is not to say that other national, provincial funding bodies are excluded. Indeed, the transparency with which CIHR operates makes it easier to scrutinize. What are PHAC, Health Canada, Correctional Services doing with the strategic funds? The lack of transparency has crept in since the Harper government came to power. The culture of silence is slowly creeping its way into other organizations and institutions beyond the federal government. How are provincial funding bodies allocating funding? I see the creation of funding monopolies in which there are fewer opportunities for investigator-driven research, more and more directed funding under the name of strategic targeting really means control of what knowledge is produced and by whom, implying that researchers choose their research willy-nilly as they sit in their ivory towers looking at the passing clouds. In some cases, advisory committees to, fund, to funding bodies once a marker of openness and representativeness are now used as a way to silence the voices. Some funding bodies are doing research and competing with researchers for funding. The HIV movement has been founded on the principles of speaking out without fear of reprisal. I feel our colleagues in government institutions who are not feel for our government are sorry, I feel for our colleagues in government institutions who are not allowed to speak out. And I deeply dislike those who bully us into silence. The University of Toronto, with all its faults, and I'm one of its critics, even though it supports my salary, has a statement of institutional purpose, which is very inspiring, and sometimes we who work there forget it. The most crucial, it states that, the most crucial of all human rights are the rights of freedom of speech, academic freedom, and freedom of research. And it affirms that these rights are meaningless unless they entail the right to raise deeply disturbing questions and pro pro provocative challenges to the cherished belief of society at large and the institution itself. So it's in this spirit that I have spoken out and will continue to speak out, even if it means jeopardizing my research funding. I encourage more senior scientists to do the same. Let's break the culture of silence. The primary goal of the presentation was to generate an open discussion, not to upset my colleagues and friends. There are many paths to moving forward, and during this presentation I have suggested a few of them. And for the sake of time, I will just do the focus on the, on the bullets and not give you additional information. First of all, I think we clearly need to refocus our efforts and set targets to lower new infections. It's time to reinitiate a national discourse and agenda setting in order to refocus our efforts, even though it's a messy process, as I indicated. Let's take a good look at the unintended consequences of redefining the roles of researchers. Let's take the time to invest in scientific streams that have been chronically underfunded. Invest a small amount in research that identifies the structural barriers and facilitators to effectively implementing the strategy. Researchers, senior academic administrators, funding bodies and members of review committees, whether it be grant, tenure or promotions, need to revisit 
how to gauge scientific production so that quality is rated higher than quantity. And most of all, as I've indicated, we need to put an end to the culture of silence. Let's all continue to work together and do the great work that we've been doing. But let's not forget to take stock of where we are and where we want to be and identify and remove the invisible and unintended obstacles that are in our path. I would like to thank the organizing committee and CAR for this opportunity. Preparing this talk has forced me to take time to think about the past, the present, and the future. When I started to work in the field of HIV in March of 1984, I never dreamt how my life would change. I've been blessed to have worked locally, nationally, and globally with a committed group of people who have fueled my passion for research and critical thought. But I do have a dream, and I share with Mark, and I didn't know, Mark, we shared a dream. And that dream, for me, has yet to come true. And the dream is that there would be no new infections in Canada before I retire. So let's hurry up and make my dream and all our dream come true. Like our colleagues in cancer research, let's recommit to conquer HIV in our lifetime. I would like to end by acknowledging and thanking Dan Allman, Caroline Goodbo, Robin Montgomery, Ted Myers, and Robert Remus for providing input for the presentation. People talk about the importance of the work-life balance. For most HIV researchers, our work is our life. In recognition of the sacrifice that our families make in supporting our distorted view of life, I want to thank my husband, Sid, who I still have him working, he's shooting photographs today, for his infinite <laughs> tolerance. My son, Andrew, for turning out to be such a caring person, even though he didn't have a mother overing, uh, hovering over him for the past 30 years. And my beautiful two-year-old granddaughter, Aria, for reminding me about the magic of life. And thank you all for making this trip so wonderful. <laughs>